So the disclosures, both Gina and I are senior product managers at Pearson, and Pearson is a publisher of both print and digital assessments. So we'll, the examples that we'll have will be from the assessments that we know um, that Pearson publishes. Um, and you can read the rest. Those will be um, on your handout. But we're both members, uh, we're ASHA members and members of SIG 18. These are the learning objectives. So these are the things that we'll be covering today. And they're based on a lot of the questions that came in in the first um, office hours, the part one recording. Um, the part, you'll be able to describe at least two key needs of trained and untrained facilitators. You'll be able to list two considerations when testing special populations using a remote assessment. Uh, you'll be able to describe at least two options to capture an examinee's pointing response, and you'll be able to describe at least two tasks needed for you to prepare to do a remote assessment. Okay, but first, we just want to remind you that this is a one-hour webinar, so we're um, targeting certain topics. It's not meant to be your total resource on telepractice assessment, especially since there's such excellent guidance at ASHA.org. And um, a lot of information you can get through some of the Facebook groups. This is not intended to be comprehensive and shouldn't, certainly should not be considered as a requirement or a recommendation that you do an assessment via telepractice, especially with certain clients who may not um, do well in that kind of testing environment. You should be sure to remain mindful, and I looked at the wording on this today and I thought that, that doesn't seem quite right. We meant follow your own profession's best practice recommendations and the respective ethical codes because we found on, uh, even though this is office hours for SLPs, a lot of this applies across professions for OTs and psychologists, but um, your professional organization site will also have a lot of guidance on what is best, considered best practice for your profession. And there are, of course, any regulations associated with um, from licensing boards, federal, state, and local authorities, insurance providers, and payees. And you do need to know that you need to, just as we did in grad school when learning how to administer assessments face-to-face, -face, that you need to develop competence with and confidence with assessment via telepractice by practicing, studying, consulting with other professionals and engaging in professional development. It's not something that you can say, well, I've given this test many times and um, I'll just turn on the computer and try it that way. Be sure and use your clinical judgment as to whether the client that you're testing is an appropriate uh, client for a telepractice assessment. And keep in mind also the referral questions and the situations there are circumstances where it may not be feasible or appropriate for a particular client. And so let's go on. Here are the topics we're going to cover in this session. Um, other resources that where you can get information that are um, not going to be covered today in this presentation. Which tests are available digitally using facilitators and remote assessments? Um, using protective equipment as personal protective equipment in assessment. And even though that isn't necessarily just a, tele isn't a telepractice consideration, we've got a lot of questions on that, so we did want to address it briefly. Testing special populations, how to capture pointing responses in a remote administration, do's and don'ts, and some additional resources. Um, many people on the first session had questions about telepractice in general, like how does this work, tell me all about it. Again, ASHA has um, a great overview and a lot of information in the practice portal, as well as if you're in a, a member of SIG-18, the telepractice special interest group. Um, there's lots of conversations about um, a lot of the terminology, ethics, privacy, and security, all the things mentioned here. Um, a great place for recommendations about platforms or equipment is SIG-18. Uh, the recommendations come from practitioners who've tried several different platforms or uh, pieces of equipment 
and uh, can give very specific um, feedback about how they work and what their preferences are. And of course, uh, anything at all, if you have a question about telepractice, there are several Facebook groups. Um, there, are, there are a number of those that you can refer to. Um, so the first question on which tests are available in a digital format, um, on pearsonassessments.com slash telepractice, we have a list of the digital manuals and stimulus books that are available through Pearson free on two global on our two global platform in the resource library. And those will be available for no charge through July 31st. Um, when you're looking to see, of course, we all use a variety of assessments and from many different publishers. Check with the publisher of the test you're interested in and see what's available from them. Um, right now, I'm sure all the publishers are working hard to uh, get information out and resources out to people who find themselves doing telepractice unexpectedly in these last few months, and they'll have the most current information about what's in development. Um, and the last question, we got a lot of questions about is this test or that test approved for telepractice? So none of the tests that were, that exist currently uh, were developed specifically for telepractice. So many of them are very useful in a telepractice environment and there are equivalency studies for some of those assessments. Um, for the Pearson assessments, you can go to the, um, the product webpage if, if um, I was going to say, if we have it available digitally, we have a, a guidance document on the webpage that you can click on, and it takes you to um, a document that explains what special considerations might be needed in administering the test. Because we've really ramped up the availability of tests available digitally. We haven't caught up completely um, with having all those guidance documents available, but for those that you use the most, you'll be able to find a document that talks about what, what you need to keep in mind when you're administering the test and if there are special considerations for certain subtests of tests. And we, we should be getting into that a little bit more later. Um, another, we refer a lot to the platforms that we have here at Pearson, the Q Global platform, which is, can be used with any web-enabled device, computer, uh, on most tablets, um, Q Interactive, which is a platform in which you use two iPads connected by Bluetooth. So one is the examiner iPad, one is the iPad for the examinee, and it is possible to to use Q Interactive for a remote administration. And we have some um, explanations of how that's done on our Pearson Assessment slash telepractice page. So if you go to that, they go into some depth about how you, how you set that up for telepractice. And then we also mentioned the Digital Assessment Library for Schools, which is an offering to school districts where they have 400 or more IEPs to have access to more than 30 assessments. Um, and, and there's a single flat annual price um, based on the number of IEPs. So um, this is kind of a, a quick reference. We weren't going to spend a lot of time on it, but you can go to Pearson's site uh, search for Q Global and get additional information in depth about what um, what what's available, uh, which tests are available. As you can see from this chart, it varies quite a bit depending on the platform. So Q Global right now has about 85 or more tests that have digital manuals and stimulus books. Q Interactive has 20 assessments. This is across psychology, speech, and OT and the Digital Assessment Library has 30 or more. The functionality is that QGlobal, you can use with any web-enabled device. It's easier to do a remote assessment if you have access to two monitors so that you can uh, display on one 
screen, you can display the stimulus materials to the client. And on the second one, you can read the administration directions as you would do face-to-face -face looking at the stim book. In, but you use a paper record form and you mark the responses on a paper record form. And if you want to have it scored digitally, that's a separate purchase. On Q Interactive, all of that is integrated. So you have an, you're using you're using your iPad to administer the test. Um, the client's not using their iPad uh, to point to pictures, but you can mirror your screen from your second monitor and have the client. Um, respond to the picture stimuli and then scoring is done automatically and you can receive a report it's a lot easier to <laughs> it's a lot easier to take a look at our um, at our videos on pearsonassessment.com slash telepractice to see how that actually looks and it's for detailed information about what would best serve your specific needs and your setup um, as well as that for the client, uh, contact an assessment consultant. You can contact customer support and they can put you in touch with someone who can help you with that. I'm going to turn this over to Tina on facilitating. Thanks, Nancy. Yep, sounds good. Thanks, Nancy. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Tina Eichstead, and I'm happy to be here with Nancy this morning. Uh, talking to you all about some of the intricacies of remote assessment and just assessment at this time. So welcome and we're, we'll get to as many questions as we can. As Nancy said, so, many, so much of what we're going to be talking about today through the rest of the webinar has everything to do with all the questions we've got in the first webinar we did in May. So if you haven't seen that first webinar, um, it's recorded, it's on the website and you can watch that at any time. This is a follow-on, and so between this series of webinars that we're going to be doing about telepractice, we hope that we can get to all of your questions and more. So certainly, um, let's jump in now with a topic related to the use of facilitators, which was a very uh, frequently asked question in our first webinar, and I know continues to be a question that many of you have as you look at how the summer and fall will go for you in your particular clinical setting. So um, I want to refer you to a particular document that we have on our website, but let me make a couple of comments here first. Um, when you think about facilitators, you may call them e-helpers, you may call them e-facilitators, you may call them uh, proctors, whatever the name is that you have for these people that are not the examinee, but they are on the examinee side. Um, we use the term facilitators just to think about what their role is in a remote assessment. Of course, we believe that you should have one um, because in many cases, the examinee should not be the one logging on to a system or setting up the remote administration, getting connected technologically. Uh, and so we really recommend, you know, most of the time, if not almost all the time, you should really have a facilitator. There may be occasions where you have an examinee that's particularly capable that can log themselves on, but I think those would be more often the exception than the rule. Um, we refer to two kinds of facilitators in our document that I'm about to share with you that's on our website, either a trained or a professional level facilitator, maybe an SLPA, maybe um, a, a paraprofessional in a school that you've trained, somebody working in a professional context that has training beyond what you're telling them um, for this particular assessment versus an untrained facilitator, non-professional, just really meaning someone in a family, parent, or caregiver context for this remote assessment. So you want to think about in, when you're doing a remote assessment in those two facilitator types or contexts. And really the role of that facilitator, there's sort of a universal role that we'll talk about, of course, as I alluded to a second ago, it may be related to the technology setup, troubleshooting the audio or video, getting connected to the particular telepractice platform that you're using. But beyond that, it also is a consideration for you to think about the type of task or tasks that you want to administer in that telepractice context. We're going to talk about a few, uh, four of them and kind of how we think about them from an assessment standpoint. 
um, because they're really different. So if you're doing a questionnaire, maybe you're sending a form, it's an asynchronous, not at the same time um, kind of questionnaire, versus even a live questionnaire that you're doing real time, that's a very different kind of task than having a written response booklet in front of you for a writing response from the examinee, or maybe using some blocks, or having some type of manipulative, which we would consider a complex task, and then the range of things in between. So we'll talk about those in a second. And really, the final general principle to think about with facilitators is that you really need a pre-meeting. As Nancy mentioned a, a few slides ago, this is not something that you just say, oh, we're going to do an assessment today and go, right? This is something that you need to stop. You need to think about ahead of time. You need to have a conversation with your facilitator and with the examinee, testing the technology, understanding what's going to be required in the test te assessment task that you select as the examiner, and really have that training ahead of the event of the assessment itself. So really to think about this is sort of a two-step process, three if you account uh, for what happens after you debrief after the fact, but certainly this pre-meeting piece is really an essential part of remote assessment. So with that, and, and I don't expect you to read this whole document, but this document lives on our website. Um, if you go and you want to do this real time with me uh, right now, you can go to pearsonassessments.com slash telepractice, go to the newsroom, and in the bottom right corner of that page, this document exists. So really, the use of facilitators in a remote test administration is this one pager that we offer. And we, we ask people in remote assessment um, considerations to look at the different task types and the role of the facilitator within those task types. So I talked about questionnaires. I talked about complex tasks. The two columns in the middle of that table are verbal-only tasks, like cell five repeated sentences, for example, or recalling sentences, um, as opposed to a verbal-visual task, so two modalities, which might be like a PPVT5 or EVT3. Um, if you have uh, a response that shows something visual, and then there's verbal instructions as well, and the examinee responds by a pointing response or um, just a verbal response as well. Those two task types sit in the middle of questionnaires and complex tasks. And generally speaking, the bottom two rows of this table, which I'll blow up here on the next slide, um, talk about the different types of facilitator recommendations across those tasks. Because you might anticipate, of course, that the requirements might be different depending on what the task requires of the examinee or of the technology or both. So let me jump to the next slide where we can blow up this. And again, this is on the one pager on our website. The top row of the call out here is for that trained or professional level facilitator that's on site and how we might think about that. The bottom row then is for the untrained or the parent or caregiver that might be included, those kinds of facilitators and how we might recommend. So in general, for the first two kinds of tasks, the questionnaires and the verbal only tasks, we really don't expect the facilitator to be involved at all. Really, it's tech support only. Can, did the video go out for some reason? Or was there something with the examinee's mic that I've asked as an examiner for the facilitator to adjust? Those kinds of tech support only tasks are really what the the facilitator should really only be doing. You as the examiner should drive all of those tasks ongoing. The third, the third column, um, well the fourth in this table, but the third column of um, inputs, that's for the verbal and or visual tasks. So the, there's something that we show the examinee as the examiner. Um, maybe there's a pointing response. Certainly tech support is part of that. But then with these tasks, sometimes there's something a little bit more. So you may require the facilitator to um, set up an additional camera, and we'll talk about that a little later, um, perhaps so that you can see the pointing response of the examinee. So a little bit heavier technical load for the facilitator to support those verbal and visual tasks. But really beyond that, we don't expect the facilitator to do anything more. Um, we'll talk about pointing responses in particular in a couple of slides, or in the next slide. But really, the facilitator's role in the assessment task should be as limited as possible, and really tech support only. 
The complex tasks sometimes require an additional piece. So yes, there might be an additional camera setup. Um, there's a video we have on our website called Third Camera Hacks or something like that that allow you to add an additional device into the meeting where you can see the examinee's interaction with the screen in a pointing response or down on their desktop in a response book format. Those complex tasks may require the facilitator to hand the response booklet and set it on the desktop for the examinee, perhaps hand them a pen or a pencil, um, those kinds of things that you obviously can't do because you're not in the room. So those kinds of things um, are really more in the realm of the on-site facilitator that's a professional level, um, somebody that you can add ideally in that situation who can be trained and have you start, um, ha have you give them a few more tasks rather than a parent or caregiver, which we really hope to keep um, away from the administration procedure as much as possible for obvious reasons, right? We don't want to um, have them feel tempted to support an examinee response or give an indication of what the right answer might be. They just need to be able to step away um, out of the room if possible, but certainly at, at a distance from a computer where they're not impacting the administration in any way. Certainly if, and we mentioned this at the bottom sort of in the fine print, if they need to get a Kleenex or something for the examinee or um, there's something with an article of their clothing or shoe came untied or something that distracts them in the administration. But really those untrained or non-professional facilitators, which would include parents and caregivers um, and any kind of family member, should not be involved in the administration as much as possible. So let me talk a little bit um, um, on the pointing response uh, specific component of the examiner. And really, there are many tasks, especially those in the final two columns of what I just shared on the facilitator screen, that involve a pointing response or some kind of physical response by the examinee. For many of the platforms that you all might be considering or using in a telepractice context, that's impossible to see because you're not on that side of the examinee um, and many of them uh, don't have those capabilities, them being the telepractice platforms. So obviously the principle is you need to be able to observe as an examiner what the examinee is pointing to on the screen where you show the stimuli. So as you're thinking about that, there are multiple ways that you can do that successfully where you as the examiner control and view what's happening real time. And so that's under the umbrella of you need to be able to see whatever you can see. Um, on our first webinar, uh, somebody who attended had the great idea, well, why don't you just put a mirror behind the examinee? Um, so we tried that. And certainly, if you have the right mirror at the right size, at the right angle, without the glare of the lighting, yes, a mirror behind the examinee can allow you to see the examinee's screen. Um, the, the caveat to all that, of course, is, as I just said, has to be the right size in the right place at the right time, right? So that is a low-tech way of being able to see the pointing of the examinee against the screen, better than having the facilitator or the parent or caregiver tell you what they said. Um, I would advocate for a mirror over that alternative. Certainly, um, an additional camera brings that into a digital control that's yours as well. So again, the third camera hack video on our website allows you to talk about or look and see real time how that might work, a cell phone, a tablet, um, any other device that you can bring into that telepractice meeting. We show you some examples of how that works and how great that can be for you as the examiner without the help of any kind of facilitator or e-helper, see the screen. Um, if you have a pointing or annotation tool and the examinee is capable of doing that, then that is an alternative option as well. So you can, in some platforms, hand over mouse control. If the examinee has a great um, mouse control ability, that can work just fine. Uh, and so you have to make that clinical judgment as an examiner on whether or not that examinee can handle an annotation tool or a pointing, you know, a mouse control as their pointing response for those items that require it. And finally, some of, some of our STEM books, PPVT is a great example where the responses are actually numbered. Um, you don't 
you shouldn't add numbers to a stimulus book, but in the PPVT they're already there, for example, so you can have them respond by just saying the number out loud. Um, so to the extent that a stimuli would have that kind of uh, numbered option, that would be another option um, to gather that what would typically be a pointing response. So again, just some ideas on the pointing response. I know in our speech and language world we have a lot of tests that require pointing responses. This is why you practice ahead of time so you can figure out for that examinee which the best, what, what the best option might be to take care of that test requirement that doesn't require a parent, caregiver, or facilitator telling you what the examinee said. Nancy, go ahead and uh, start with the next slide here and let's change topics. Okay, so lots of questions about special populations and what you might find as we work through this list is many of the recommendations are the same, though there are a few unique um, aspects to each of these. Um, you're always trying to determine whether or not, we wouldn't be able to say, for example, you definitely cannot work use um, a remote assessment with an, a, an early childhood kind of client, a very young client, but you certainly can for school age. So our clients um, all have different experiences with technology. They have different skill levels for certain skill levels. They're able to do the tests in a standardized fashion. Um, for others, they um, are not. Even those who can may or may not, the family may or may not be comfortable with, um, with you know, having, <laughs> having their meal times observed if you're doing an observation. Um, you know, most family members, I think, all of us are getting more and more accustomed to having our doc some doctor's appointments done um, online, but some family members may not be comfortable in an interview kind of format either. So the, the universals are that we're certainly never suggesting that you would only do a norm referenced assessment via telepractice as part of your comprehensive assessment. You have a lot of options for collecting information and some practitioners, there's for certain of these groups, you might still administer the norm reference assessment because the child can do it, but you may or may not decide whether uh, you are able to use the normative information. But you can do observational measures. Um, Tina's already talked about questionnaires or interviews, collect case history. You want to conduct your assessment via telepractice in the same way that as close as you possibly can to a face-to-face -face administration so that you can consider or make a determination whether you consider the results to be comparable or if there were other factors that were interfering with that, that there was just a lot of confusion with using a mouse, for example, with an elementary age student, um, if that was holding them up or not. Um, of course, the technology issues, there are concerns about you may have a great setup in your home if, if you're working from home or if you're working from your clinic, but there also has to be good connectivity for the clients at the remote end and assuming that they even have the technology that would be needed and how you're going to manage that. I sat in on, um, I would strongly encourage everyone who's on the line to be sure and watch the telepractice sessions that are available right now with the free pass that ASHA had, the learning pass that ASHA has provided through the end of this month, which is only eight days away. But um, there's some really good descriptions of some um, alternative venues that people are using if the client doesn't have technology in their home to work through the local public libraries if they're open in your community. Uh, they're just... They mentioned several different options for that when a client doesn't have, have technology available in the home. And even if they do, Tina talked about having the facilitator there. A lot of times the parent as a facilitator is handling uh, the technology aspects. And we'll talk a little bit more later about that pre-meeting where you really try to address all those concerns before the assessment session, not during an assessment session. Um, and for all these groups, of course, attention or behavioral considerations, how likely is the, the 
child to be to stay engaged um, and what's the home situation for them. So those are kind of the universals that really go across all these groups. Um, so Tina and I are going to kind of split this list between us depending on what our, uh, what our backgrounds are and areas of expertise. But for early childhood, um, I think that there's, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of variability in, in the ability of children to sit at a computer and do an assessment. For some of them, they're exposed to technology very early. They're used to technology. They're very engaged by technology. One of the drawbacks that we've found with um, children who are very engaged with technology is that they may decide part of the way through the test that they've had enough of your testing and they want to look for their usual games and really cool things online. So that, that would be something that you'd need to, um, whatever parts of your comprehensive assessment involve a very structured task that you try to get those done early while the child is still fresh and make sure to give the child a break if they want to switch to something else and do something else briefly because little ones are not necessarily going to be in the same kind of test mode or educational mode that kids in school are used to being asked to do a task and to complete it. Um, other than that, you really just want to see um, what can the child do. And if the child's not able to do a structured task, you would have, you would have ready your interview formats and talking to the parents about uh, the developmental history and maybe setting up some time with during, um, during meal times or during a snack time to watch how the child engages with either a caregiver or at a family, you know, at a family meal. All of that has to be set up ahead of time, of course, and then discussed not just with the parent, but how they're going to discuss it with other family members so that you can get some semblance of information about how the child is communicating with other family members. And that can be really powerful because they don't always interact with different family members in the same way they do a caregiver. I'm going to stop there and let Tina move on to school age language and literacy. Thanks, Nancy. So just the biggest thing that I'm going to say about this particular bullet that is that obviously when we get to literacy, we're talking about reading, writing, and spelling, and so many other things that go in the, in the printed context. This squarely moves us into complex tasks because there is writing going on. So as we think about language and literacy assessment done remotely, this is really a consideration that needs to be um, front and center for all of you that are working in, you know, the K-12 schools. Uh, and depending on whether or not you go back to school physically in the fall or you're working in summer school or you're working remotely and you're wanting to do assessments, the timing of that will, will be a factor in your clinical considerations of remote assessment. So if you're doing remote assessment for literacy purposes, you're doing writing. And to do writing, you need to have a place where you can see what the student is writing. Um, and, and capture it real, real time as you're watching it happen because so many of those decisions about administration matter on what the examinee did first to make a decision on what you're going on to in the administration next. So if you're going into a school and you've got a place, or maybe you're in private practice, where you've got a setup where the examinee comes in, it's sort of a clean room setup. Some people are doing that around the country right now where they're setting up a room where examinees will come in, they clean it, it's sort of the sanitized room for a remote assessment only, and the examiner isn't in that room. So you're still doing a remote assessment, but the examinee comes into the facility um, for the purposes of remote assessment. Then you have an actual document camera that you've set up as the examiner, as the organization, that allows you to look at writing responses real time. If you're doing it at home, where the examinee is at home, then that third camera is really imperative so that you ask if it's possible for the, the family or caregiver to do a makeshift document camera with a cell phone or with a tablet that points down on the desktop so that you can see what's happening um, with the examinee's writing. 
So those are big considerations in literacy evaluations, of course, because of those complex tasks involving writing. So we give a lot of guidance on those in, in the tests that have those kinds of components. And um, certainly more is forthcoming always. But those you know, warrant special considerations for school age language and literacy. I'll move to the adults as well. That's my clinical background. Also, I, I worked acute care, neuro and trauma, and we were at a regional center where we had satellite centers that were remote. And we would physically drive there you know, a couple times a week to see patients. So for those of you that are in the adult world and doing healthcare or private practice and have uh, sort of a catchment area that you might serve from a regional center, uh, remote assessment and setting up those local uh, clean rooms, if you will, or sanitized rooms in a facility where patients might be able to come in, even though you're in the regional hub, you can certainly do remote assessment um, in that context, and we would recommend that. Certainly adults have other needs if you're working on somebody, uh, or working with setting up an evaluation for somebody who's post-stroke, of course, there's issues of hemiparesis, and there's issues of visual changes, visual field changes that will impact your decision about whether or not a remote administration is possible. So certainly in the, in the adult assessment world, there's, there's data on uh, equivalency, certainly for many of these tasks, and certainly more so for adults in some cases, the, the scientific base is, is growing and, and pretty robust as it stands today. But there are a lot of different nuances with adults. Make sure they have their glasses on and their hearing aids, and especially if that's, appro if that's applicable to the examinee. Um, but it's not, it, it's not, again, something that's just a shoot from the hip kind of approach. It's still managing and, and anticipating all the details that might be needed for those adults who have uh, potential communication cognitive challenges that need your um, sleuthing I think before you would jump in to an administration context. Certainly possible, but adults have unique needs just as much as children do. So uh, consider those, certainly as you go through adults. And we just did a Western aphasia battery webinar last week that's now posted on our website for those of you in the adult space that want some details in that context as well. Nancy, back to you for English language learners and severe profound disabilities. Okay, thanks, Gina. So for English language learners, we already know those are complex administrations in a face-to-face -face situation, or they're at least lengthy. So if the test is a dual language test, it still usually takes somewhat longer than testing in one language only, but that is best, still best practice to be able to do that. Um, if you're testing and administering a whole English test and a whole Spanish test, you might have to consider um, just like you do in a face-to-face -face situation, multiple multiple sessions um, so that you can get that all done and, and give the student time to be able to respond. Um, if you're working with uh, a professional interpreter, then besides the meeting with the pre-meeting with the family, if you're testing in the home, you would need to set up that pre-meeting with an interpreter as well, depending on their uh, familiarity with um, doing assessments versus some of the other work that they might do in their professional life um, to be able to be on-site and translating as, as you go. Um, knowing that, that can be concerning if you're not familiar with the language and able to check uh, what the what the person is saying, there's a lot of training that goes on and there's a lot of continuing ed available again on the ASHA website about working with interpreters and preparing for that. But that just adds an additional couple of layers to an assessment for English language learners. For individuals who are severely or profoundly impaired, um, I didn't listen to this one yet, but ASHA has a webinar on doing, conducting AAC evaluations via telepractice, so I'd recommend you take a look at that. Um, if a child has significant motor impairment, you would want to be working closely with an OT and with that family to see if um, what kind of positioning would be needed and if there is a way for 
the child to participate in in certain certain kinds of subtests and certain kinds of test formats, and of course, including the other forms of assessment such as observations. If um, don't rule out very severely impaired kids. Some of them do have, um, if they're if they're in a family that uses a lot of technology, they might already be quite familiar with technology, and it will involve working closely with other professionals to see um, if the child is uh, what kind of accommodations will be needed for the child to be able to participate in some of the test formats that you'd like to check out. The um, Certainly some of the simpler pointing responses and expressive responses, if they're intelligible, um, we used to do that all the time in, a, in several settings where I worked. And, um, and they were quite consistent in their responses and very attentive. There are a lot of tests for, um, for very young children if they're functioning at that level. Some of the materials are not particularly appropriate for an older individual. So you'd have to use your discretion with really how you want to handle that. You might use functional objects instead of toys to see how they interact with others. And the same thing is when you're looking at a child who's very young, um, see if you can set up with the, with the family a way to observe the individual um, and see how they communicate in a family environment, in a family activity or at meal times or during the snack time. So I said some of these would be really, they go across all these groups that you want to look at functional communication as well as um, getting information from those who know that individual best and can give you a lot of information about how they communicate um, as well as through very structured tasks. And even if you feel that um, if you've had to make a lot of modifications on the test tasks, you certainly would not use the scores, but you would use those as descriptive measures. Let's go on to the next. Uh, the assessment do's and don'ts. Actually, what you'll see is that the do will explain um, what uh, what you should do, and the don't is, of course, the polar opposite of that. So you need to practice. We had an exercise in our own work setting so that we could uh, get some experience with a couple of different scenarios with the tests that we have and practicing with other people. And one of our, one of our coworkers pointed out that she felt that, yes, after six, after six administrations of a test, she felt comfortable with the functionality <laughs> because your goal it, it really, for you to be able to use the scores at all, even if the child is cooperative, you want the situation to be, it needs to move as smoothly as an in-person administration. You can't just try out your telepractice platform. You need to make sure that you can get to all the right screens and toggle back and forth as you need to to present different test materials to the individual. Um, and you also need to practice with your assessment. So as comfortable as you may be with it in a face-to-face -face setting, because um, there are often some tests that go very smoothly, no problems, you feel like it's exactly the same as an in-person administration. Others are a little bit glitchier. And so one example is the concepts in following directions test. You need to have the camera set up ready so that you can see what the child is pointing to. I don't think we have any test items left on the Excel 5 where we say point to the uh, point to these answers with both thumbs, which you can't, unless you have a camera on that child, you can't see if they're doing it or not. Um, so you need to <laughs> you need to make sure you've worked through the entire assessment. So that's the second bullet. Find a volunteer. Don't make you certainly don't want to make uh, one of your clients go through this activity, um, but find a volunteer or a vo person who's voluntold to sit through an entire test administration. So whatever test you choose to administer, um, have them sit through the entire test administration. Every item, 
every subtest you plan to administer. You don't want to find out in the middle of an assessment with a child that, oh, I've got to have the, um, we've got to adjust the camera, or I need the camera this time, and I didn't think I would need to. Um, and the last one is schedule that pre-meeting. You need to know, um, you need to talk with the parents about where the child will be situated if you're tested, testing in the home, where, where they're going to set up the test room, what the rest of the family is going to be doing at that time, because it's very easy to have the sounds of the video game coming through on your telepractice platform, uh, or kids coming in to interrupt. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, uh, you need to talk to the, if the caregiver is going to be your facilitator, you need to talk about how they will participate in session, if they will, if they're comfortable or not, because you need to make sure about that, and what exactly they'll be doing. And Tina talked quite a bit about that um, initially. So you'll see we keep talking about it's not the time to problem solve. As familiar as you are maybe with using a teleconferencing platform, uh, maybe for work, it's a rather different experience actually planning to administer the test. Um, Tina and I were trying a few different things when we were testing coworkers, and it took a surprising amount of time to go, oh, I didn't expect this. The best way this is going to be um, to work out having that third camera is to invite the person whose camera, it, uh, whose phone it is to the meeting as well so that I can see the child pointing. So um, as much as we knew that was an issue, we ran into some little surprises when we uh, were trying out a number of different kinds of tests with different kinds of formats, and we expect that you will find the same thing. Um, the, AC, um, the AAC webinar is on ASHA.org. It's in the, if you go to the learning path section, sorry, I just saw this question about the AAC webinar. So that's not one that Pearson put together, that's one that's available through ASHA. Tina, it's back to you. I think. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh. Oh, no, it's not. Thanks, Nancy. Mine. Okay. Now it's nope. mine. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna make me sing. I'm not gonna sing. Um, there is there is a time and a place for people to consider of when you should not do an assessment remotely. And so, as Nancy and I were building this, as we've think, thought about this over the years, really since we've been working in this space since about 2012, you know, there are times when you just should do norm reference standardized assessments with an examinee. And so this is where we fall squarely into the world of clinical judgment. And you, all of us, as SLPs and professionals, need to make that call when it's important to make it. So certainly, when we're sick, we should not be taking an assessment. Um, when you have an examinee um, that has instabilities that you really deem are are distracting to an assessment event to get that best performance. Um, there are a host of issues that can come up that you'll discover in your pre-meetings, again, another reason for a pre-meeting before an assessment, where you, you just, in your gut, you know clinically from all of our training that this is not appropriate. You need to trust that, and you need to make those decisions that you can um, in those pre-meetings at the time where you say, this isn't, this isn't viable, this is not going to work. And that is your call to make as the professional um, and as a team where that team decision-based appropriate uh, um, uh, decision-making happens. And really think about all of these reasons when it's time to abort. Yes, we're on a path. Yes, there's a lot we can do in norm reference standardized assessments remotely, but it's not a universal go. Um, so really consider those times where letting it go is the right response. Because you have alternatives, you have informal assessment, you have questionnaires, you have all those kinds of things that doesn't require you to do this kind of assessment in every case. There are still numbers that you can generate, there are still scores that you can provide that aren't norm reference standardized assessments. So let us 
be very clear about that, that this is not a universally applied strategy. There are resources, you'll see this in the handout when we send this with the recording in a, in a little bit later today. Um, our landing page has been alive and well for years. Um, when COVID-19 and all the stay-at-home orders hit, of course, we revamped that and added just a tremendous amount more uh, content and resources for all of you. The videos that we referenced today are all there. There are um, overview videos, sort of news headline videos. There are deep dives into particular topics. All of the places where individual test guidance is there. Um, we have a new cleaning and disinfecting test materials um, piece that we published last week. We're working on one for personal protective equipment now um, when you're doing in-person assessment again or at times. Um, please feel free to bookmark that and go back there. The content is being updated almost daily at this point. One of the big questions that we got in our part one webinar in May was, can't you just get online and show us how to do this in one of these webinars? So we, we could. Certainly we've practiced a lot, but we also wanted to just be very clear about why we're not in a webinar like this. Just lots of people said, just, just do this. Just get online and show us so that we can all see it and then we'll move on with our day. That, w that would be one way we could go. But you know, given the size of this group, the size of the groups that we have, we have over 600 people online right now. Um, last time in May, we had over 1,800. It's just sort of hard in terms of the size of people. And we really believe that if you're going to do this, you need to try. Um, some trial and error is a very, very wise learning strategy. So we've got a lot of videos on our website. We're talking a lot of, uh, um, about a lot of issues here. But we really need you to roll up your sleeves if you haven't done it and try it yourself. Uh, grab a colleague. Cause as we all understand, some of the best ways of learning are immersive. So jump in. Um, we referred to ASHA's website quite a bit, the practice portal, all their webinars. I failed to mention the uh, webinar that they did sponsored by SIG2 for you and all of you in the adult world that the VA team was on. Fantastic webinar. Um, there are demos online. You can reach out to your assessment consultant on our Pearson staff that can give you that live demo as well. But there's no replacement for you trying it yourself. So um, uh, feel free to do that and use our resources as you can, but that's why we haven't done a live demonstration, not the least of which is this is a public recording, and so anybody in the world could see what we've talked about today, and we have to protect the test content for test security purposes. We just have about five minutes left, and I have one more topic here before we answer a couple of questions that we didn't get to in the chat. Um, but one, this is a little bit of a shift because we've been talking about remote assessment. And when you're in remote assessment, of course, you don't need to worry about PPE in the same ways. But so many of us are in a stage where we're looking at a hybrid world coming this fall. And so we might be in person for some things. We might be remote for some things. And we're getting a lot of questions around PPE in assessment and when it's appropriate and how it might be appropriate. We've got a document that's in editing right now that we're working on. We should have that out to you in the next week or so for your consideration. But really, as we're looking at PPE in in-person assessment, as we go ahead, we didn't want to miss an opportunity to say, yes, all of these things are in consideration, from gloves to gowns to face shields and masks to physical barriers, all of those things that we use in an in-person context to you know, keep keep ourselves and our examinees safe. Um, all of those may impact the responses of the examinees, the presentations of you as an examiner of test content, and how those um, scoring and um, administration procedures go are relevant. So we're trying to be comprehensive in how we think about this. The obvious one is you should really not be using a mask on a phonemic task for you or the examinee. That just sort of is common sense, right? So as we think about those phonemic, those tight administrations of that content, we have to think about those. We also, in this document, will offer some alternatives to PPE. For example, if you use our Q Interactive platform, you can have those iPads separated by a distance up to 30 feet. So that's well beyond what um, physical distancing requirements are. And if you have a large enough room, you put the examinee on one side of the room and you can sit on the other, and you'll be more than six feet away. You can be a lot farther than that away and still be together and have 
the two Bluetooth iPads work just fine. I mentioned the clean room idea um, earlier, and so think about that. This is coming. Know that we're thinking a lot about it because you're thinking a lot about it. And so as soon as we have that in place, we'll be supportive, keeping in mind, of course, that there are really no data on PPE in an assessment context. So we're, we're all working with the best information we have today. In terms of what's coming next, we've got more digital products coming. Uh, Nancy talked a little bit at the top of the webinar about what we currently have today that you can find on our website that's uh, free in digital STEM books and manuals through J July 31st. We have more guidance documents coming, so when we publish something in a digital context, we try to have guidance documents for that particular test and the tasks in that test together. And then really, um, Many of you have asked what happens after the free trial ends, July 31st. We are also working on that. We should have some announcements in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so for many of you as SLPs, you know that we've been in this space really um, since 2012. So many of our speech and language tests are already digital and have been digital, so that won't change. Um, what's more coming to that for SLPs it is what we're preparing for for all of your needs after July 31st. And then certainly we also have a lot of university folks that are on the line today and have been asking us about, we're going to be remote again this fall when school starts in at the university level, how can we teach in our classrooms and, and do the diagnostics courses and the assessment courses that we need to do. More information is forthcoming on that for university partners as well. We are really pretty close to out of time. So there is one question that I was about to answer in the chat, and so let me just do this live now, and then Nancy, you can have a couple of final comments also as we wrap up this hour. The question was, um, the appropriateness around assessing a student via online or only in person, um, what, if, what if the school is only doing remote learning, um, and thinking about the, the clock ticking once the evaluation or the consent from parents is signed. And that's really that appropriateness. It really depends on that examinee in your setting. So we believe the data suggests that you have options, remotely and in person, of course, and how you handle that is really up to your organization. But certainly we wouldn't say that it's inappropriate to do remote assessment if you're in a distance learning context. But you need to take into consideration that examining your organizational rules, certainly in all the factors that we've talked about this hour um, related to your decision making around remote assessment. Thanks to the team for managing the chat box. Nancy, um, do you have final comments for the group before we close out? No, I think that if you didn't attend the first session, um, there, that recording is available. We covered, uh, there were some topics that overlapped, but definitely not all of them. So you can take a look at that. We have two more sessions coming up where we'll also go back to the, the chat boxes and see what else we have not addressed and cover those in future sessions. Thanks so much, and we thank everybody for your time today, and we wish you a great week. Take care.